everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar, Recall Risk Reduction Through Allergen Monitoring. Our speaker for the webinar today is Dr. Doug Marshall. I'm Genevieve Randall, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Before we begin, I'll let you know more about how this webinar will run. The webinar is being recorded, and the slides and recording will be available for you within three business days. A short Q&A session will follow the presentation to answer viewers' submitted questions. During the webinar, you can submit questions you have using the webinar sidebar menu. Select the questions tab, type in your question, then hit the enter key on your keyboard. Remember, you can submit questions throughout the webinar. Now I'll give a quick overview of Eurofins. Eurofins is driven by our mission to contribute to global health by offering the highest quality testing, training, auditing, and consulting services. We strive to listen to our customers and not simply meet, but exceed their expectations. Our footprint is global with over 45,000 staff in 650 laboratories across 45 countries and a portfolio of over 150,000 analytical methods. Eurofins provides a unique range of analytical testing services to the pharmaceutical, food, environmental, and consumer products industries and to governments. Now I will pass the webinar off to Dr. Doug Marshall for his presentation. Doug, you can begin. Thank you very much, Genevieve, and I really do want to thank everyone for spending an hour with us to go over this topic. And uh, let's move along. This is a content-rich uh, presentation, so uh, no time to dilly down. So when you look at uh, one of the motivations for FISMA, FDA had a couple of items that uh, were important and have direct relationship with uh, allergens and foods. The first of which is um, many manufacturers simply have a lack of understanding of the hazards that are associated with their products. And FDA has shown that up to 60% of all problems are inherited from the ingredients supply. And then the second thing is lack of training of employees on their knowledge of hazards that are reasonably likely to occur and when they may be present. So both of these are relevant issues with uh, undeclared allergies and foods. Genevieve, we have a polling question, I believe. We will pause now for that quick polling question. And the question is, do you use do you uh, do routine testing of supplier raw materials and ingredients? Um, now the question should be on your screen. Select from one of the answer choices. I'll leave the poll for open for about 30 seconds before I close it and share the anonymous results. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll now. And now you can see that about 60% of attendees said that they do currently do routine testing of supplier raw materials and ingredients. Okay, thank you everyone that responded. And now I'll pass the webinar back to Doug. Okay. Thanks, Genevieve. That question was put in there to be able to address the question of in your supplier verification activities, uh, making sure that you aren't inheriting allergens from that supply chain uh, is, is a critical component. And doing uh, routine verification testing gives you data points to see whether or not your uh, supply chain controls are working for allergens. Uh, when you look at the history of allergen recalls, it's pretty evident, at least in this slide, that um, allergens remain the leading cause of food recall. So this tells me that the industry continues to struggle with their allergen control programs. And then when you look at um, uh, recalls in 2017, which allergens are the primary offenders? Um, milk allergens uh, seem to be the leading cause of recalls. And then you could look at some of the other ones down here um, that are also contributors. But again, this just shows you that a wide number of allergens, uh, the manufacturing sector is having difficulties um, keeping those out of products. 
or properly declaring them on the label. Okay, when you look at allergen failures that lead to uh, recalls, we have formulation failures. Um, this is where you have a genius R&D team coming up with new product formulations and failing to communicate to the uh, quality and safety teams that they have now just introduced an allergen into those formulations that you hadn't previously recognized. We have rework control failures. So this is taking allergen-containing rework and putting it into non-allergen-containing uh, new materials. We have difficulties in companies that have to do a, uh, an allergen clean changeover going from allergen-containing product to non-allergen-containing product. And the difficulty is making sure that you are effectively removing that allergen residue from those surfaces prior to uh, restart. And then uh, the primary one happens to be uh, one that we've recognized for many, many years, and that's just the failure to understand the importance of putting a proper label on uh, consumer-facing packages where the allergens in the product are properly delivered. And uh, we also have an understanding that overuse of um, allergen uh, warning statements where you just say, hey, we have all the big eights or manufactured in a facility that also manufactures. Um, these aren't effective uh, preventative controls. And uh, the reason why is those who are susceptible to a food allergen, um, they will tend to ignore those labels if it's the ingredients don't actually say the allergenic food is in the ingredient list. Okay, why uh, are food allergens of concern? Um, it's estimated there are greater than 170 foods that can cause some type of human uh, allergic response when consumed by a susceptible consumer. Uh, all of these are uh, proteins in nature. Uh, most of these are water soluble, so they're easily presented to, to a consumer during consumption. Uh, there's a wide variation in the uh, protein amino acid sequence and structure. And they have multiple antibody sites. So um, again, if you are susceptible, it, you don't have necessarily have to consume the entire protein or intact protein. You could consume peptides or fragments that might also achieve the same uh, kind of sensitivity. Uh, most of these proteins are resistant to heat, uh, meaning you can't kill the allergenic potential by uh, cooking. And sensitive individuals exposed to food allergens can experience a very severe respiratory distress that can potentially lead to death. So uh, what are the uh, symptoms that uh, affected consumers might, might be presented with? Well, you, many people can have a mild condition. These can include things like mouth itching, face flushing, swollen lips and throat and or hives. Uh, in severe cases, you can get a severe drop in blood pressure, respiratory distress, leading to uh, fatal outcomes. There are some potential uh, other secondary effects, such as delayed hypersensitivity, that include uh, common food poisoning symptoms like vomiting, diarrhea. You can also get skin conditions like eczema and or uh, additional respiratory conditions like asthma. Um, as best we know, there's no cure. Um, there is early treatment and intervention to avoid severe reactions. And most allergy sufferers um, need to avoid uh, exposure uh, to manage their, their situation. Um, in most jurisdictions, there's a regulatory action level that uh, involves a zero tolerance. And we know, for example, that um, highly sensitive individuals can. Um, be uh, susceptible to extremely small doses. Regulated allergens uh, vary by regulatory jurisdiction. So if you are an exporter, uh, please make sure you understand the regulatory um, posturing in the country that you are exporting to. So in the US, we have peanuts, tree nuts, a big long list of uh, uh, tree nuts, crustacean shellfish, finfish, milk, eggs, wheat, and soy, and then you can look at Canada and the UK. Uh, gluten is a protein that is found in wheat, barley, rye, spelt, triticale, and corsan. Uh, 
Uh, it's a protein that's found there in consumption uh, by a certain group of individuals that um, are sensitive. They can get an autoimmune intestinal response called celiac disease. So that's uh, only around 1% of the population. And this leads to increased incur occurrence of infertility, bone density problems, neurological defects, and some cancers. Now, that's uh, to be differentiated from what seems to be popularly uh, uh, considered is a gluten sensitivity. And uh, the evidence out there is, is not very good, but uh, apparently people think that gluten causes every um, adverse condition known to humankind. And so uh, there's a desire not to consume gluten or gluten-containing products. Please. What about um, uh, the possibility of intentional or unintentional adulteration with allergens in ingredients? Unfortunately, a couple of years ago, we had a um, situation where cumin was adulterated with uh, peanut protein. And the question uh, that I think uh, needs um, some additional resolution is, was this unintentional agricultural contamination where cumin and peanuts are grown in the same fields, maybe use the same harvesting equipment and harvesting sacks that so you could have the potential for unintentional contamination? Or I've got a picture here of brown peanut holes and cumin. They appear relatively uh, similar, so there is potential for economic adulteration using uh, ground peanut shells as an adulterant of cumin. So there are a number of preventive control programs that manufacturers should be using to control allergen contamination um, in their products. Uh, obviously, training programs such as attending this webinar is a good thing. Written records showing batch records and sanitation control. So batch records are going to have the ingredients going into a particular product. And then the sanitation records are important to be using a validated and verified um, allergen clean uh, changeover if needed. You need to validate the effectiveness of these control measures before they're routinely used. And then you're going to do food label review for your labeling. And then obviously we work for a testing business, so making sure you have testing data points gives you uh, additional assurance that these programs are working. So in a, a well-designed food allergen control program, these are some of the elements that uh, uh, I recommend you put into your written program. So use these as bullet heads and then fill in the details. So you've got training, um, how you're applying your supplier verification program for allergen control. Uh, what does your product label review look like? And do you have records showing that you're actually doing it on a routine basis? If you need to do it, I um, equipment changeover, making sure you've got a validated cleaning process that works. And then preventing cross-contact during uh, processing is good. So looking at your scheduling of your production runs, controlling rework. Uh, in an ideal world, you'd have separate uh, production lines, one for allergens, one for those that don't contain allergens. And then looking at your equipment to design and make sure that it can actually be uh, effectively cleaned. For your ingredient controls, um, this comes back to know what you're buying and don't inherit your supplier problems. So it's important to use an improved suppliers list to make sure that you're pushing back at allergen controls on your supply chain. And then you must also identify all ingredients coming into your facility that contain allergens and make sure those are appropriately tagged and tracked throughout their use. You want to check uh, the labels at uh, receiving and make sure they're um, contain uh, appropriate allergen declarations for your products. We certainly advise using color coding and storage segregation of allergen containing materials and ingredients. Make sure when you're doing formula change that you understand that some of those formula changes could be bringing in allergens. And again, remember some ingredients, the allergen might be present there in a cryptid uh, label. So for example, if you have an ingredient that has casein, uh, your employees may not recognize that that is a protein that originates from milk. 
and then doing batch verification, and then of course testing to make sure you're not bringing um, allergens into the processing environment that you don't recognize. So preventing allergen cross contact becomes important. Um, here you're looking at uh, deploying your sanitation program as your preventive control. You need to make sure that you've got thorough removal of the allergenic protein when you're doing a changeover to uh, products that do not have allergens. You'll also want to look at traffic control throughout the facility to make sure that your employees or equipment that is being used is not tracking allergenic protein uh, to places where they're um, not uh, expected to be. Obviously, segregation of allergen-containing and allergen-free ingredients is important. Air and dust control uh, is often overlooked. And then in your cleaning processes, if you're doing dry cleaning with high pressure air, uh, make sure that you're not aerolizing uh, allergenic proteins throughout the facility during that process. And the same can be said for water control to make sure that if you're using uh, high pressure water, that you're also not aerosolizing allergens from allergen containing uh, equipment to non allergen containing equipment. So if you do have to do an allergen clean changeover, um, these are some recommendations that we have. Make sure you've got a specific uh, sanitation SOP that details how you're going to do this changeover. So the more detail you put in that SOP, the better able you're going to achieve the outcomes you desire. You need to make sure that your sanitation crew isn't put in a short shift environment where they've got to rush their allergen cleaning protocol because you need to um, keep your production running. So make sure you've got enough time to do it right. On equipment that is particularly difficult to clean, uh, absolutely make sure that you disassemble and manually clean that to make sure you're getting all of that um, uh, protein residue out of those um, uh, nooks and crannies. And then uh, any accessory tools that you're using both for cleaning but also use for uh, manufacturing. Uh, are appropriate for use and can be easily cleaned and sanitized. Um, anything that is difficult to clean, you may want to consider dedicating that equipment specific for either allergen-containing materials or non-allergen-containing materials so that you, so that you can uh, have assurance that that equipment is fit for purpose. And um, where you have systems that are really difficult to break down or really difficult to clean, um, you can do some additional remediation, such as uh, doing a product flush uh, through those lines to be able to remove material that's adherent. So this could be a wet wash, it could be an inert ingredient such as sugar or salt, or it could be uh, using new material that, that uh, scrubs out that uh, allergen when you're putting that first bolus of product into the system. Genevieve, I've got technical hiccups here. Bear with me for a second. Okay. There we go, I'm back. Um, in your SOPs, again, I asked you to make sure that it is thorough and details as much as possible what you intend to do. Here are some uh, sections in an allergen changeover SOP that would be good to have. Um, Again, uh, we've already talked about some of these details, but again, um, I won't go into all of these bullet points, but you can uh, look at those and, and use those as appropriate. Next, please. Here are some examples of process changeovers. So if you are doing wet sanitation, you could use your, your full um, sanitation practice. Uh, again, when we talk about allergen removal, we're really um, putting our focus on the cleaning process because your sanitation chemicals, although they're strong oxalates, they may not uh, denature the protein sufficiently to remove their allergenic potential. So we're really focused on allergen removal at the cleaning step. So you could go ahead and do your full sanitation routine and make sure that um, allergens are removed from that equipment. Or if you're doing an abbreviation 
abbreviated sanitation step, where in case you may only be using water or using water in a detergent, um, that could be an appropriate way to remove allergens as well. If you're doing dry sanitation, uh, you're going to be relying on scraping, vacuuming, physical removal of larger visible bits. Um, some people will use air to attempt to blow out um, residue from that. Just be aware that if you are doing that, uh, be very careful because you might be aerosolizing allergenic proteins throughout the manufacturing site. Uh, third alternative is you could do a product flush. So again, you're flushing with inert uh, materials, or you could flush with new product that uh, does not have the allergen uh, of concern. And what you're doing is you're going to be discarding the early parts of that product flush that contains the allergenic protein. So you will need to know how much of that product to discard uh, during the slushing. We'll describe a validation uh, protocol for you in, in a minute. Next. So at the end of the day, all of these preventive controls, we want to be in a situation where we're not going to be surprised at what's in our product. So we certainly don't want to be looking at a, at a manufactured lot and having to flip the coin and say, yes, we got the allergens out of there or we didn't. Next, please. So that raises the question, how do we best achieve a level of knowledge that says that our um, preventive controls are working? Well, um, we certainly advise getting as much test data as you can because that data tells a story about the effectiveness of your programs. So why would you want to test for allergens? Well, clearly the first and foremost is you don't want to be one of the many folks that uh, continually are having allergen control problems leading to recalls. Really uh, not a very good uh, marketing achievement for you to be splashed on those recalls. Certainly, there's a regulatory expectation. Many of you may have customer relationships that require you to have very vigorous allergen control programs. Um, you also want to use test data to uh, validate the effectiveness of your interventions and um, validate whether or not your supply chain uh, and your suppliers have their act together. And certainly, when you have issues, you'll want to collect abundant test data during your investigation. For food allergen testing, um, you want to make sure that you are not solely relying on end product testing as the only data point, um, simply because if you're doing a great job, the level of allergens in those final products um, are going to be um, very low to non-existent. So um, are you really going to get a, enough working data that would inform you whether or not your entire program is working? So just be aware of that. If mixed allergens are present, uh, the question comes, well, should I test for all of them or can I simplify my testing process? So you could use the following logic. You could test for the greatest risk allergen or you could test for the allergen that's present in the greatest concentration on the surfaces in the product or you could test for the allergen that's most difficult to remove. So for example, uh, you could test for milk proteins and chocolates and caramels, so, or um, would you test for cooked eggs that might also be in those products? Alternatively, you could test for the allergen that's present at the least concentration when in the presence of an abundant allergen. So, for example, if you have peanut butter in the presence of large amounts of soy flour, then uh, perhaps you would want to look for the presence of, of peanut butter. Next, please. Just remember that you have to justify your choice of which allergen you're going to test for in a mixed allergen uh, scenario. So a um, couple of terms that we're going to use throughout the, the rest of this talk is validation and verification. And a lot of people get these confused. I like to talk about validation first because uh, what you're using um, validation data for is to prove that your SOP um, is giving you the outcome you expect before you start using it in, in routine practice. So in this case, you could be validating uh, your SOPs for allergen removal or allergen reduction uh, on equipment surfaces. So in this case, we advise using an allergen-specific test for proof. Uh, 
once you have validated that your SOP works, then uh, we encourage you to do periodic verification testing just to uh, make sure that you're achieving the outcome you expect. Um, and this can include things like visual observation for cleanliness, uh, a protein test of those um, allergen contaminated surfaces. Um, a lot of people use ATP for this purpose for um, microbial control and sanitation uh, effectiveness. But just remember that ATP is not a protein-specific assay. And unless you have validated uh, your relative light units against uh, allergen contamination, it may tell you absolutely nothing about the presence of allergens on those equipment surfaces. So to simplify, so for uh, validation, does the process work? And then verification is, are we doing what we say we're doing, getting an outcome we expect? So some tools that you can use for allergen uh, verification testing. Uh, again, we talked about visual inspection, and the sensitivity of this is in the eyes of the beholder, literally. But uh, if you can visually see uh, gross levels of food residue on a surface, I think it's safe to say that the allergen has not been properly removed. Uh, we talked about ATP swabbing, allergen swabbing. Because there are so many allergen-specific test kits out there, um, I think it's uh, reasonable to make the assumption that using these for your allergen verification activities is the right thing to do. When you think about method selection, uh, this is some uh, practical information for you to contemplate. Don't make it harder than it has to be. Uh, for example, um, you know, make sure when you are collecting test data that you're picking surfaces that are most difficult to clean. Uh, you don't have to test um, every inch of your equipment if you know you've got the potential for hot spots. Put your legs or focus on those hot spots. And I think you can assume that the easy to clean uh, surfaces will follow. Sample for the types of allergens expected in the room. Choose those that are most abundant. And choose those that are most difficult to remove. So if you've got um, powders and paste that get in nooks and crannies or are difficult to remove, then that's where you would place your uh, emphasis on testing. And then make sure you validate the method that you are using on dirty equipment to make sure that it can actually detect the allergen before you start using that on clean equipment. Because if it doesn't detect at a level of sensitivity on dirty equipment, then you're going to be getting a whole bunch of data that says the equipment's clean and not have really assurance that your method can detect the allergen. And then uh, select appropriate equipment and tools that are specific for allergen testing. So I'm going to harp on ATP again because I want to make sure everybody understands uh, the pitfalls using that for allergen um, cleaning verification testing. Um, they may not be useful for uh, directly measuring whether that equipment is allergen clean. There are many uh, kits then that are out there that do work quite well, but just make sure the kit that you're using is fit for purpose and that it has a limited quantification or detection that is suitable for the level of contamination that you may have on your equipment. Um, and then also make sure that the specificity of the kit is good for the kinds of proteins that you have on that equipment. So for example, if you're um, uh, using a kit that is specific for um, casein, but you've got a milk protein that is not casein related, then that kit's going to tell you everything is going well in your allergen removal. However, it may not be effectively removed because you're targeting the wrong protein. Okay, we're going to pause for another polling question. And that question will be on your screen now. So the question is, do you have a validated allergen cleaning SOP, yes or no? I'll leave this question open for about 30 seconds and then I'll close the poll and share the anonymous results. 
Okay, I'm gonna close the poll now. And it looks like about 70% seven, uh, of attendees to this webinar do have a validated allergen cleaning SOP. Okay, thanks to everyone that responded. And Doug, you can continue with your presentation. Thank you, uh, that's uh, good to see. So when, for those of you who have your um, uh, validated uh, SOP, uh, hopefully this isn't going to be too redundant for you. But um, uh, when you're validating your plan, then you also need to understand that um, you could deal with your allergy management uh, program as part of a prerequisite program or as a separate uh, plan. Back in the old days when everybody was doing HACCP, we attempted to put that as a CCP for label verification. And uh, obviously FDA and the recall data shows that that was not a very good way to manage it. Um, your initial cleaning validation should be contacted, uh, conducted at least two successive times at two different time points to ensure that you uh, get repeatable results. And the validation should include uh, a worst case scenario. For example, uh, focusing on uh, products that have allergens at high levels or that are difficult to remove. And then uh, follow that up with um, allergens that um, areas that are also uh, very difficult to clean. So if your uh, products uh, that contains the allergen or your cleaning regime changes, so anytime you have product or process changes, you need to revalidate your uh, cleaning SOP. And uh, we also recommend that you revalidate um, your cleaning SOP periodically, but probably do that at least once a year to make sure that you've got confidence that your SOP is working. And again, if your formulation contains multiple allergens, then uh, you could probably target the allergen that's there at the highest percentage of the load. So what to test for? Um, we recommend that you answer these questions in your allergen uh, control plan. So what are you gonna test for, where, and when are you going to sample? And so you could test for the final, you could test allergen in the final product. You could test for allergens on surfaces and personnel. You could look at the air, you could look at water. But again, you need to be very specific in what you're going to test for and maybe provide some rationale for why you're testing that equipment. So some examples of validation strategies are after you do, if you've got an open system where you've got access to the equipment and you can easily break it down and clean it, then after you do your process changeover uh, and then prior to production of non-allergen containing product, you can use allergen-specific swabs to ensure that the allergenic protein and or proteins of interest have been adequately removed. You've got a closed system or uh, in, a, in an open system. After you do your process changeover, again, you can use a product testing program that tests for the first product that comes off of that line. The logic here is that that product is going through, it's going to be picking up any residual allergenic protein, so its concentration should be greatest on the first um, um, bolus of product that comes off the line. And then you would uh, place that uh, product on hold and, and test that product, and that will tell you whether the lot uh, that uh, immediately comes uh, after which is uh, likely to be allergen clean. If you've got a closed system, then uh, after, again, you're running allergen-containing product, you flush the system with an inert, inert ingredient, and then you use a sampling program to test that inert ingredient as it comes off, and that tells you how much of this inert ingredient you have to flush through to adequately remove all the protein. So our friends at um, uh, University of Nebraska um, uh, Food Allergy Research Program have a couple of uh, really nice slides here that talk about um, a validation process um, for allergen removal during cleaning. So in this case, this is surface sampling. Uh, 
So you run the formula through with the allergen that you want to remove, and you want to test that dirty equipment for the presence of that allergen. So you want to make sure that you validate it, that your test um, regime actually detects the allergen. You perform your uh, documented process changeover, and then you would uh, perform testing on that surface to make sure that it is, in fact, allergen clean. And if, in fact, it is, then you have validated that process cleanup. If you detect the allergenic protein on that surface, then your process needs to be revised. And the next example, where you might be doing product flush, is again, you're doing your positive control by um, testing um, the product that goes through to make sure you can detect the allergen in the product. You perform your process changeover, and then you uh, verify whether you can detect the allergen in that. So you're running an inner product or you're running the next product formulation through. You're taking multiple samples of that product flush as it comes through and measuring by time or weight at what point do you no longer detect allergen in that product. And then that tells you how much of that product you need to flush through to effectively remove um, the allergenic protein. Now, make sure if you're running the next formulation through that that residual uh, product that you collect is either destroyed, if it, you want to rework it, it needs to get reworked into allergen-containing product. Please don't rework it into non-allergen-containing product. So analytical verification, um, make sure that the kits that you're using or the tests that you're using, or if you're outsourcing to a laboratory, that they are using uh, tests that are fit for purpose. And generally speaking, um, there are a number of these kits by many, many different vendors that, that are available in the marketplace. Just be aware that not all kits and not all tests are created equal. So it will be important for you to understand what the sensitivity level of these tests are. So for example, the limited detection or the limited quantification are important questions to ask of your um, testing vendors. So what is an acceptable level of sensitivity? This is difficult one to ask because we don't, you know, the regulatory tolerance is zero, at least in the U.S. We also know that some allergen-sensitive individuals are exquisitely sensitive to extremely small doses. And so, um, you know, the kits aren't going to give you a limited detection of zero. So just because it comes back as not detected doesn't necessarily mean the surface or the product is completely free of that allergenic protein. So you want to make sure that you document all of your validation um, activities because this becomes your evidence base to um, uh, inform your uh, allergen control plan. And so again, make sure you include all this validation data in your uh, um, control plan. And these are some of that data that you should have in there. What sampling procedures are you using and justify why you're doing that? What methods you're using, including limits of detection? Um, the results of the analysis and whether they meet your required criteria. So you need to set specification levels. And it's also important to put uh, next steps in that record. So um, what decisions are you going to be making based on those analytical results? If you have a spec limit, what's your next action if that uh, data comes back out of spec? And then again, uh, you're going to focus most of your testing on allergen removal in uh, areas where product is exposed to the environment and before final package closure, So, because this is where you're going to get allergen cross-contact potential. What kinds of samples can you use? So these are just some examples. Finished product, product residue in, on the equipment, food contact surfaces, non-contact surfaces, air and water. 
not that dissimilar from surfaces in uh, your microbiology and environmental monitoring plan. A note on sponges and swabs, please make sure you're using uh, tools that are fit for purpose. Please don't be using uh, microbiological sponges and swabs because they may not be uh, appropriate. Uh, for example, some of these will contain carrier buffer that have uh, food allergenic proteins in there as ingredients. So for example, um, milk and, and silly digest can be common in these. So if you are using these tools to test for milk or silly allergen, they may uh, come back positive, not because of the presence on your equipment, because it's present in the tools that you're using for uh, sample collection. Make sure that the individuals collecting these samples are not uh, cross um, contacting those samples with dirty hands, attire, um, and you're getting uh, false pauses because of a sloppy collection. And uh, make sure you've got a search and destroy mission mindset. You want to make an effort to find areas that are difficult to clean. And use these data results to educate your employees. Bring these data to life and, and use them to improve your processes. question we frequently get is um, how many samples do I need to test and how often do I need to test? Very challenging uh, questions to answer because uh, um, an armchair quarterback like me is going to have very little knowledge of the risks that you have in your products in the process. So you should be using risk-based principles and answering these questions. So look at your history and trends, the features of the plant, the types of product and the volume that you're manufacturing, plant layout and product flow. So uh, all these will be uh, determined um, by you and will assess the risk that you have. If you're a low risk manufacturer, then you need to argue you're gonna use a lower testing frequency and fewer number of samples. Certainly advise that when you first start getting started in your allergen verification um, activities, that you need data to inform you on that risk. So front load your testing budget, collect as much data as you can, and that's gonna be very beneficial in helping you define your risk. I also recommend that you do uh, uh, increased sampling whenever you have the following events. So whenever you change ingredient suppliers, or you have formulation changes in your products. Whenever you do construction events, such as uh, moving in a new piece of equipment, it may be easier or more difficult to clean than the equipment that it is replacing. Um, anytime you find an out-of-spec result, you should be doing intensive investigational sampling to figure out how widespread the excursion event is. Be aware that when you're manufacturing certain kinds of products, that the nature of those products can have an adverse effect on whether the allergenic protein can be detected by whatever um, test protocol you're using. For example, um, uh, these kinds of food processing can denature some of these proteins and make it more difficult for the test kits that you might be using to detect the allergenic protein. So things like heating, fermentation, um, extreme uh, acids or alkali treatments, anytime you're using enzymes to hydrolyze proteins, whenever the proteins coagulate and you get a protein um, carbohydrate lipid mixture, it may make it more difficult to present that protein to your test kits. And uh, anytime you might have extraction difficulties to prepare an extract to present to the kit, all these can affect the ability of that method to uh, detect the allergen. Here's an example of where that can occur. So um, this was a report a few years ago where um, the uh, allergen, depending on the matrix, can be more difficult to be recovered based on that matrix. And so again, this is uh, um, um, egg protein seem to be easily recovered, but walnut protein, when you put it into uh, similar kinds of matrices, the recovery could be dramatically reduced. So when you think about which methods can do I want to use, I just want to briefly go over some of the pros and cons of some of these technologies. 
Um, most folks are going to be uh, using an ELISA-based kit um, if they're doing uh, a fair number of samples. Uh, if you're doing uh, only onesies and twosies, uh, then maybe a lateral flow-based uh, device is, is a, a, a better kit for you. But just be aware that um, uh, these uh, technologies are based on antibody antigen reactions. And if there's uh, some influence on the inability of these kits to detect the proteins, you need to know that. Uh, in those circumstances, there's uh, alternative methods. So you could do DNA-based methods that are primarily based on PCR. And so in this case, you're not really going after allergenic protein. What you're going after is nucleic acids from the uh, source um, of those allergen proteins. So and just give you a quick example, instead of going after milk allergen protein, you could be going after bovine DNA. If there's bovine DNA um, residue in the product or the equipment, the argument is there's probably also a milk protein uh, resident there. If you have very low quantities of heat processed allergenic proteins in a complex matrix, then you might want to be looking at some very sophisticated analytical chemistry tools such as um, uh, LCMS and S. Um, or if you're looking at multiple allergens and you only want to do one test instead of multiple tests, then perhaps that tool could also be uh, useful for you. So uh, be aware that uh, all these um, kits and, and methods have pros and cons. So uh, DNA may not be detected in highly processed materials, such as oils, um, uh, milk where the somatic cells have been removed, or in egg whites where there's very little residual um, uh, DNA present. Also be aware that the uh, method may be uh, interfered when you have high levels of PCR inhibitors, such as uh, metals, lipids, and, and proteins. And then uh, if you have a need for differentiation, let's say you need uh, beet protein versus milk protein or chicken versus egg, if you're going after bovine, it will detect um, bovine uh, DNA that may be related to beef protein or milk protein. And again, like uh, processing, sometimes a, if you do a high acid process or a fermentation process, that DNA can fragment DNA and uh, poison the, the ability of PCR to detect that source um, genetic information. And then it also might be important for you to attempt to correlate the presence of uh, PCR reaction product with the actual presence of uh, allergenic protein. So if you get an out-of-spec result, uh, make sure you do appropriate corrective actions. So make sure you limit access to the area. Uh, understand why your cleaning SLP uh, did not work or why your supply chain control program did not work or why your um, label review program did not work. So you need to understand how the failure occurred. Certainly, if there's potential for greater problems in the facility, do increase sampling and investigative monitoring to understand how widespread the problem is. And then um, make sure that you have appropriately remediated the problem before you restart production. Uh, your goal, at least on environmental monitoring, is to make sure you've got uh, repeated measures that show that your corrective action has um, effectively taken place. Document your corrective actions. If you have repeat, repeat out-of-spec results, that tells you that your corrective action isn't working, and you either need to reevaluate how you're doing the process, and that reevaluation might include removing a piece of equipment that is just impossible to keep um, allergen clean. I'm going to conclude by talking about some solutions that Europeans offers to our customers and uh, just tell you that these tools are readily available and I'll give you some contact information at the conclusion. So uh, Eurofence Technologies um, has a couple of kits available that uh, are available for allergen testing. So we offer ELISA kits that are um, uh, quite competitive in the marketplace. They come in formats that are 48 well or 96 well, depending on the number of tests you want to perform. Uh, 
and uh, they're fast and easy to use. Next, please. We also offer lateral flow tests that if you're not doing that kind of volume of testing and don't want to continually burn a plate, then a lateral flow kit may be of value to you. And uh, uh, just like the ELISA kits, they use uh, immunochemistry for detecting the allergenic protein. And um, they're very, very simple to use. They're, they're much like a, a home pregnancy test. And then on the laboratory testing side, okay, sorry, I got one more slide here. Uh, we have um, uh, kits that are available for most of the allergens that are, are of concern for you. And so this table just details. And we're in constant product development to um, add uh, additional kits for um, proteins that uh, may be, be of value to you. Okay, and then on the laboratory testing side, if you decide to outsource our allergen center of excellence uh, in the food division is uh, Europe's gene scan in New Orleans. And the contact information is there for Andrew. And then on the kit side, you can contact Aaron for information on our kits. So Genevieve, I think that concludes my presentation and it looks like we've got a few minutes for a Q and A if anybody has dumped some of those in your direction. Thank you much. All right. Thank you, Doug, for your presentation. Um, for the Q and A session, um, you can continue to submit questions throughout. Any unanswered questions will be followed up with by our uh, speaker, and he is joined for the Q&A session by two panelists, Aaron Huckabee and Pierce Smith. So our first question is, where does coconut fit in the allergen scheme? Okay, well, cocoa in and of itself is not one of the regulated allergens in the U.S. And uh, typically, um, you may want to be looking at the potential for cross-contamination of that supply from other ingredients. So for example, if a cocoa processor is um, in a growing region that also grows allergenic um, raw materials, there's potential for cross-contact just due to agriculture or harvesting um, equipment, harvesting sacks and materials, or shared uh, processing environments where there may be potential for um, allergen cross-contact of that cocoa. So you really would be going um, at that at the um, supplier verification um, activity. On the other hand, cocoa is an ingredient in chocolate, and if you're using chocolates where you have mixed nuts in a confectionery product, then those mixed nuts clearly are a major um, uh, allergen source. And so you would want to understand um, the nature of that in your process. So that's what I can do on an answer. Okay, thanks, Doug. Next question is, does dry sanitation, um, scrape, vacuum, physical removal, work for equipment that uses mostly flour but has some shortening or other wet ingredients? Well, that's a difficult question to answer because I'm not at the uh, questioner's facility to actually see how adherent um, the product mass is. So if you're doing dry uh, sanitation, dry cleaning, then those other ingredients uh, in the flour seem to me to be able to form a tackier substance and make it much more challenging to do um, physical removal. So in that case, you're going to have to do scraping, scrubbing um, to be able to do an effective removal other than just vacuuming. Okay, so for our next question, do you recommend air sampling for allergens? And if so, what method should be used? Okay, it, it really depends on the nature of uh, the air. I'm going to make the assumption that the questioner is just talking about ambient air in a facility in contrast to something like compressed air that might be used to open a packaging um, bag during packaging or uh, 
high pressure air that's being used for um, other kinds of applications or something like vacuuming, vacuum air that's used to uh, transport um, particulate matter through a vacuum tube, for example. So if we just focus in on ambient air, I think the question that I would ask is um, why would you want to test that air? Um, obviously, the questioner thinks that that's important. And then you could use um, sampling devices that either pull the air onto a collection device, so it could be a filter. You could use gravity settling, where you just expose an open bag, or you could ask your uh, laboratory to give you a Petri dish and do gravity settling. You would want to place these uh, collection devices near higher risk areas in your facility um, rather than lower risk areas, and then expose those collection devices for a period of time that you think product is exposed to that ambient air, and then uh, seal those containers. And then uh, you would probably want to do a distilled water rinse to be able to try and collect the samples if you're able to present that to your. A test kit. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, another question. If there are limitations to PCR testing, under what circumstances would you need to go to the DNA level to confirm presence of allergens? The, um, the best example I can give you is where you've got a very complicated matrix. And, you know, very complicated could be something like um, a loaf of bread. I know that doesn't sound very complicated, but when you look at the matrix and all the other ingredients that are in that bread, or you may have um, uh, areas where the allergenic protein is just so difficult to remove that it adheres to a surface and you do your surface swabbing and you don't detect it yet, you know that it's there. So in those circumstances, then you might be uh, wanting to do PCR. The other example would be where you've got either an absence of test kits, um, that would be ELISA or lateral flow, for an allergenic protein. And under those circumstances, you could look for um, the presence of the DNA. Or if you're looking for uh, original source material, let's say you've got multiple kinds of fish in a product and you want to, um, rather than just look for uh, fish protein, you might be wanting to look for the relative abundances of the different kinds of fish in that product. And that would be difficult to be able to answer that, that question using a wise method, but you could do a, a PCR method to get you that kind of data. So there aren't a lot of examples where that would be important, but um, I've given you at least a, a, a short handful where maybe that would be good for you to contemplate. All right. I think this will be our last question for the session. Remember, after, um, after this webinar concludes, you can expect a email with a copy of the slides and a link to the recording of the webinar. You'll re receive that in the next three business days. And our last question is, are allergen-specific swabs for equipment services necessary for both verification and validation? Um, I would never say that they're necessary, but they're really, really good. So if you're not using these allergen-specific tests, then that leaves you open to criticism when an inspector, an auditor, or a customer comes to visit and they say, hey, you're only using, let's say, a protein swab, or you're only doing visual inspection, or you're only using ATP, how do those tests correlate with the presence of allergenic protein on those surfaces? So if you have not done that validation study, then you have no scientific rebuttal to justify your choice of, of testing. So uh, that would be my caveat if you're not going to do that. All right. Well, that wraps up our Q&A session. I just want to remind everyone again that a recording of this webinar along with a copy of the slides will be available in three business days. Thank you, Doug, for your expertise and your excellent presentation. And thank you, everyone, for attending.